Well, good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with our missions moment this week. Uh, we have a representative this week here in person with us from uh, Calvary Home for Children, one of our local benevolent ministries. Uh, Laura Lindsley is going to come up in a minute and tell us about that ministry. But before she does, we have a short video uh, about it. I'm Abby. I'm nine years old. I love puppy dogs, unicorns, and books. I also like annoying my older brother, Caden, but it's okay because he likes annoying me too. Me and Caden are both in foster care right now. We weren't always. Back when we were really little, our mom and dad were together. I don't really remember that because they divorced when I was only three. But Caden says they fought all the time, and at first, Mommy was really sad all the time. But then she met Eric, and he became my stepdad. After Mommy married Eric, things got worse. Eric would get angry at us and her for no reason, but Mommy always took his side. Eric also wouldn't really let us go anywhere or do anything. We just stayed at home all the time, and it was so boring and lonely. We didn't even get to go to school. One night, I accidentally spilt my milk at the dinner table and it went everywhere. Eric got up screaming that he was gonna teach me a lesson and picked me up from the table by my arm. After that, Caden and I came to Calvary home. Calvary home, I was scared. This sounds dumb, but I didn't know how to talk with people. I was really shy and just kind of kept to myself. But Mimi and Papa just kept including us in their family, and eventually I started talking more. They made us go to school. I don't really like school, but I do like having friends there that I get to see every day. We also get to go places. Mimi and Papa took us shopping at the mall and let us pick out our own clothes. We got to go to the beach and saw the ocean for the first time. I even got my own ukulele lessons. Caden is so real protective of me, but he's also learned that it's Mimi and Papa's job to take care of me. Sometimes they still have to remind him of that. I don't know what's gonna happen to us. Mommy won't leave Eric, so I can't go home. But I know that as long as we need a safe place to be, Mimi and Papa, will let us stay with them. I miss my mom, but I don't really miss being home. When I grow up, I want to foster kids too, just like Mimi and Papa. No, that's okay. So um, thank you guys, first of all, for letting me come out and, and take a few minutes of your time. Um, but I love this video because I think it really shows who we are and, and what we do through her story. Um, so little Abby, in, ca in case you couldn't follow along, she, um, when her mom married Eric, they moved out into the middle of nowhere, the boonies. There was a little mobile home in the middle of 50 acres, and when they say they never left and didn't go to school, she didn't go to school for three years. And so she didn't go to school, they didn't go to the doctor, they didn't go to the dentist, they never went to the grocery store, they didn't go anywhere. And so um, when she came to Calvary Home with her brother, Caden, they were able to stay together, which is very rare in foster care for siblings of opposite genders to be able to stay together. Um, so they were able to stay together and being able to watch them experience new things and go to Target for the first time <laughs> and go back to school and she had ukulele lessons and Caden was able to join the baseball team. Um, it was just really everything had this level of excitement 
that we don't see anymore, I don't think, in, ch in children. Um, but I, I love that they were able to come to Calvary Home and we were able to kind of walk them through experiencing all those things again and really restoring their childhood. Um, and that is a big focus point for us at Calvary Home is, is restoring their childhood. We see a lot of kids who the older sibling is raising all the younger siblings. Um, we've seen eight-year-olds taking care of six-month-olds. And there, there is a great level of responsibility that comes in learning how to take care of your siblings and love your siblings well. But um, an eight-year-old is, is not in, responsible for taking care of a six-month-old baby, <laughs> um, every aspect of that baby's life and survival. Um, our, that eight-year-old specifically um, was found by the mailman, no less. Um, it's very cliche, but he um, and his baby brother, who was six months old, were just left. The mom just left them um, for what we figured out later was about three weeks. And the boys ate all the food in the house, and the eight-year-old used all the baby formula in the house. And he kept his baby brother alive by taking a piece of bread out of the freezer every day and mixing it with water and spoon feeding it to his baby brother like cereal. Um, and that's what kept his little six month old from starving. Um, and so we see some really, really hard things. Um, these kids have come from some really hard places, um, places that you and I really are pretty fortunate that we didn't have to walk that road. Um, that we're blessed and it's really just by God's grace alone that we can sit on this side of the table um, and so that's really what I think at the heart of Calvary Home who we are um, yes it's our job to step in and provide food shelter clothing education but our job really at the heart of ministry is to step into the mess with these children just like God stepped into our mess and um, so I'm, I could tell a lot of stories about our children, but I know that there might be some questions. So I don't know, I know it's a big room, but you can feel free to shout a question at me. Um, but currently we have five homes on our campus that each have a family in them. And so our families live on our campus and that's their full-time address. We, we kind of equate it to if you were packing up and selling your belongings to go be a missionary in Honduras or Ecuador. Um, it's kind of the same principle, except you're moving to Anderson. Um, you don't have to get shots to come and be a missionary um, at, with us. So, <laughs> um, but you, you would live on our campus and um, you, you help raise foster children. You're really filling in the gap um, that, that DSS um, will place the children with us at Calvary Home and they're with us until uh, the court system rules that mom and dad either are healthy enough to get the children back or maybe there's a healthy family member. Uh, sometimes those parents can never be rehabilitated and in that case the parents rights are terminated and those children come up for adoption. Um, so those kids stay with us until a family can be identified for adoption. Um, so that's really kind of the heart of who we are, um, loving kids and pointing them to Jesus. Um, one thing I do like to point out a lot is that we only hire um, married couples to run our homes. And that the reason why it's so important is because most of our kids don't know who their dad is or their mom has had many, many boyfriends along the way. Um, my husband and I, we were house parents at Calvary, and we had a 10-year-old little girl who she instantly started calling my husband daddy. And a lot of people were like, oh, that, that's so sweet. Like, she loves him so much. And, but really, it's because in her 10 years of life, she had had 13 daddies because her mom just had a lot of boyfriends that she chose to live with for survival. Um, and so she, our little, this little girl who was 10, um, didn't know what it would like, what it was like to have a true dad and a true father. And so when she saw my husband come home every day, <laughs> the same man every day, and she didn't see us move out, <laughs> that, that was very rare to her. 
Um, and so she spent several years with us um, and we stay in contact with her and she has asked um, my husband to actually give her away when she gets married, um, which I think is really a testimony of who she connected with and what she realized what a true heart of a father is. Um, and really we were just trying to point her to Christ through that, um, through that whole thing. But um, does anyone have any questions? Because I love a question. Carol is the only name I know, but so I'm glad it was her. Okay, so in case you didn't hear um, Miss Carol's question, she said, do we evangelize to our children, um, right? So we do. Um, so we are at the core, we are a faith-based ministry. Um, so we are, we say we are not a social services agency that happens to love Jesus. We are a faith-based Christ-serving ministry that does social services. Um, so at the core, we love Jesus and we wanna serve him and we wanna point our kids to Christ. Um, and so we do have an initiative called Gospel Day One. Um, and so our kids on the very first day that they come to us, they hear the gospel message um, and, and sometimes it's usually, I don't know if you guys see those bracelets that are the colored beads that tell the gospel story. Thank you for the head shake. Appreciate it. Um, <laughs> but, um, so we actually had a little boy who he, DSS called us. He came to stay at Calvary Home. And, um, the very next day, his aunt was certified to be able to take him and so he went to go live with his aunt the very next day he was only with us for like 15 hours but in those 15 hours he heard the gospel message one-on-one -on -one with his foster mom through that bracelet he had a nighttime devotion with his whole foster family he was prayed over at bedtime tuck-in and then they had a bible study that morning before all the other kids went to school so in four times in 15 hours, he heard a gospel message. Um, and so this little guy, his name was Benjamin, he, he was with us for a very short period of time, but he left with a seed planted. And what I know that God's word doesn't come back void. And so that, um, we might never see what that seed blooms into, but, um, but God knows. And I think that that's why he was with us. He was with us for those 15 hours so he could hear the gospel message um, during that very hard and difficult night of his life being removed from his family. So thank you for that question. Yeah. Does anybody else have a question? Yeah, did you guys hear her? Um, so she said several years ago she heard that there was some pushback from DSS at, at the state level um, about faith-based ministries and foster care and evangelism and all the things we just talked about. Um, and, and yes, that is, that is true. Um, so there was actually some federal legislation that came down to the state level. So as of 2021, we no longer receive any kind of federal or state funding um, because of that. So um, that kind of goes back to how we said we are not a social services agency that happens to love Jesus, but we love Jesus, want to serve him, and happen to do social services. Um, so we chose to, um, through a lot of prayer and, and our board meeting, but we had to really get to the heart of who we are and really lean into the faith and, and believing that God will provide and God will fill in that financial gap. But in 2021, um, we, we decided, well, we decided earlier than that, but it went into effect in 21 that we no longer received any kind of federal or state funding. Um, which it counted for about a third of our budget. So it was a little over $300,000 every single year. Um, so that's, that's a lot. <laughs> it's, 
it's a lot of money that we had to let go of and say we would we don't need this money because we want to stay true to who we are and what we believe as a ministry. Um, but last year, God was so faithful, um, and we met budget in 2021, and we're slightly over halfway through the year, and we're pushing through. So, um, so I just I see God's provision and His protection and how. He has helped us fill in that gap in just some really bizarre ways, um, and he always provides a way. We we had a little boy. His name was Chandler, <laughs> and he he wanted to play violin, and y'all don't know Chandler, but he was kind of a a quirky little boy, and and he when he came and he was always trying new things. So when he said, Miss Laura, I really need. A violin for school and they all know that I'm the one that gets all the things I go and beg all the people for all the things um, but I didn't know anybody who plays the violin like or who would be excited about this I had no idea um, so he asked me and I'm like well let me think about it and I'll see what I can do and so then three weeks later he comes miss Laura I really need a violin for school I really want to do this so of course I said, why do you want to play the violin? And he, very seriously, he said, I want to get the ladies. <laughs> so I was very, it was very funny, but um, he did tell me that if I got him a violin, he would dedicate his first song to me at his first concert. So then I was very dedicated to get him a violin. So we just really prayed for the Lord to, to find us a violin somewhere. And I called people and people who I thought played violin, which they didn't. I don't know why I thought they played the violin, but it's fine. But one day I was cleaning out our closet that had all these wires and extension cords and a bunch of man stuff in it. And um, and so I'm cleaning all this stuff out and there's this weird shaped black case at the top of the closet that I didn't know what it was. And so I pulled it down and opened it up and y'all, it was a violin. <laughs> And I asked everybody, why is there a violin stuck at the top of this closet? Who did this? Is this your violin? I asked our director, who's been there for 14 years, did you just, because he does, he just finds things and sticks things up in weird closets and leaves it there. Did you do this? No, no, it wasn't. And so no one really knows where the violin came from. Um, but, you know, I know that the Lord put the violin there. <laughs> um, it doesn't really matter where it came from. But so Chandler got to play the violin and at his first concert he really did look out at me and he played his little song and then he said and it was cute so so I'm just really thankful for the opportunity to work alongside this ministry and see how God provides in sometimes really creative ways um, and so if you're interested in partnering with us financially the easiest way to do that is um, you can give online through our website um, or you can mail in a check. Uh, if you're interested, I don't, you guys have small groups here? Yes. Um, if you're interested in doing like a small group service day or a collection as a small group, you can just call me at the office. Um, just, I can give you my number if that would be helpful, but my number is 361-2957, and you can just call me and tell me who you are, and we can come up with um, a creative way that you guys can partner with us. So I would love that, but I always say that it's not the least that you can do. It's the greatest thing that you can do is to partner with us in prayer um, because our kids have been through some really hard things and some really hard seasons, and they're still going through a lot of transition and grief. Um, and so please just pray for this ministry and our children um, and our families as they really serve on the front lines taking care of these kids. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to pray in a moment for Calvary Home and for some of the things we just heard. I want to update you on a, a few of the prayer items in our intercessor. You'll find these at the center of your table. Uh, Trisha, Trisha Economitis uh, had a spine surgery uh, last Friday, so let's pray for her recovery, as well as uh, Lucille Lindsay, uh, who's dealing with chronic nosebleeds and fatigue uh, for weeks now. Uh, also, let's be praying for Shirley Duncan. Uh, she uh, was in the ICU, still in the ICU. Is anybody not in the ICU anymore? Okay, 
she's coming out. Uh, but let's be praying for Shirley uh, as she recovers uh, from the last few days. Uh, with those things in mind, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. We'll have a few pray, and then Bob Anderson will give us our lesson from the Psalms. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to gather as your people this evening uh, to pray and to hear from your word. Uh, we do so uh, in acknowledgement, Lord, uh, of your great glory and your mercy towards us, how worthy you are of our praise and our worship uh, this evening. Uh, we thank you that you are our Father and that we ourselves all know uh, the, the gift and the privilege of adoption, uh, that though we were fatherless, uh, you became our Father. We became your children. You are our God and we your people, and we rejoice in this fact, Lord. We pray uh, for Calvary Children's Home as they seek to minister to the uh, physical but also the spiritual needs of those who are orphaned and those looking for uh, permanent homes, waiting to return to their homes perhaps, or going to new homes in the future. Uh, whatever their circumstances are, we thank you that there is a, a gospel light being presented to these children that day one they hear the truth of Jesus and how he has saved uh, his people from his sin and that by believing in him, uh, they too can have eternal life. We pray that you would prosper this ministry, uh, help these uh, workers and these foster parents to share the gospel well, uh, be with them and bless them as they do so. Be with these children, Lord, as they hear of Jesus. Uh, would that be a great comfort to them in the midst of difficult situations? Would he be an anchor for their soul, a great hope uh, kept for them in heaven? Uh, would they know him and would they know you? And would you do so through your word and through your servants at Calvary Home? Lord, I want to pray for a number of other things according to the needs of your saints. I do pray for uh, Shirley as she's recovering from these last few days in the hospital. We pray that you would uh, be gracious to her, that you would comfort her, that you would cause her to know that you hold her by your right hand, that you are present with her even in her suffering. We pray that you would give her uh, more days on this earth to continue uh, worshiping you here. Uh, and Lord, we pray uh, that you do so for your own glory. To pray for Lucille Lindsay as she's uh, struggling with these chronic nosebleeds. Would you uh, relieve her of these symptoms? Would you heal her, Lord? Uh, we know that you are a God who is able to heal, and we pray that you would do, do so. And to pray for Tricia Economitis, uh, who's had this spine surgery, Lord, uh, and a, a, a severe surgery, Lord, and a serious thing. And so we, we lift her up to you, uh, entrusting that you are uh, the good father, Lord, that you are one who cares for his people, and that you uh, will provide for her uh, even in her rest and her recovery. Uh, would you restore to her the strength of her body, that she'd be able to return uh, even to the place of worship here uh, at Second, that she'd be able to gather with your people again and worship you together with us. Uh, we long uh, for these things to be answered, Lord, and we entrust them to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Christ, uh, praying with all these things in mind uh, that your will would be done, Lord, and not our own. Uh, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our God and Father, I come now to pray for the purpose of the church. That is to glorify our our Lord Jesus Christ, by proclaiming the gospel message throughout the world. Lord, even as we speak now, there are those today, even now, who are hearing the good news of our Lord Jesus, that there is hope. Lord, we do thank you for all of those who go out into the world. We know that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. How are they to hear unless someone preaches? And how, unless someone is sent, are they to hear? Yes, Lord, we thank you for the work that goes on throughout the world. And Lord, we lift up our local work. We thank even now of the ministry, to, the mission of Main Street. For the number of years that we've been out there talking with people right on our Main Street here in Greenville, telling them the good news. Yes, Lord, thank you for all those who have volunteered Pray that many more would come to declare the good news here in our city. Lord, we thank you for other works that you give us to do. We thank now of the good news clubs that are going on from the Child Evangelism Fellowship. The young children are hearing about our Lord Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you will bless those who volunteer, that they will not grow weary in well-doing, that you will bless that and that these young children, many, will come to know the truth. 
And, Lord, we think of other ministries as well. We pray that the prison ministry would open up again soon. We also pray for our ministry at the Oak Retirement Home. Pray that you will bless that, that you will bless those people there, that they will hear the good news. And, Lord, we will especially want to lift up tonight the work of Koinea right here. We think of Barnetta Stevens and the hard work that she has done over the years and pray for all those who volunteer, who minister to our needs, people who are unable to get about and people who have special needs. Lord, we thank you for it. We pray you will bless that work and thank you for all those who volunteer to work in it. May you bless that and may it continue on and may they also not grow weary in well-doing. And may they know and, and feel that they are doing a ministry that brings honor and glory to you. May you bless it in every way. We pray especially for Barnetta. You'll bless her as she guides this, that you will give her much wisdom as she directs this, this ministry. Again, Lord, we thank you for all the work you're doing here. We pray that we will be faithful to do what you've called us to do, that you might be glorified in all that we say and do. In Christ's name we pray. In our great God and Father, we come before you tonight and we thank you that you we can come before you and we can lift up our request to you. And you hear and you answer our prayers in your wisdom. So, Father, we thank you for that. Father, tonight I lift up to you and I pray for <clears throat> the mission work that we are able as Second Presbyterian Church to be involved in. I lift up to you all those who serve you around the world. Father, I'm thankful for um, what Second Church has done with including the mission moment in their Wednesday night service where we can get to know personally better each one of our missionaries and the things that they uh, face um, in the different parts of the world. So tonight I lift up to you several of our missionaries. I uh, pray for uh, the Shinavans, Jagar Shinavan, who uh, works in um, church planning in Northern Virginia. I pray for them. I thank you that uh, their um, green card situation has been resolved. And so, Father, I just ask that uh, you be with them uh, they are especially gifted to be able to address the Asian community uh, in that part of the world. So, Father, I ask your blessings uh, on the work of the Shinavans in uh, northern Virginia. Father, I lift up to you and pray for the country of Haiti. We have uh, two of uh, fellows uh, serving you there in Haiti, Haiti being a very evil place, a very uh, place without a real... Uh, strong government and um, where gangs have uh, um, basically controlled the laws there in Haiti. But Father, your word goes forth. And um, Father, I thank you for Octavius Delphi's and S.E.A. Antion as they serve you in Haiti. I pray that you'll be with them and encourage them. And Father, I also pray that you will keep them safe in the work that they do there in Haiti. Father, I pray for the Dye family, Roger and Laura Dye. I pray for them as they minister to families uh, in the Latin American countries. And tonight I particularly uh, lift up to you and pray for the uh, uh, <clears throat> marriage uh, seminar that they'll be having in Bogota, Colombia, where over 200 to 250 couples will be joining them in this seminar in September. So, Father, I lift that up to you and pray that uh, that goes well and that you can help them uh, know how to build a biblical family uh, in their marriages. Father, I pray for June Gallman. Lift her up to you and her work in Costa Rica. I pray that... Um, I pray that the jails will open soon to allow her to go back in to uh, meet again with the women there in the, the prison near where she is. And Father, uh, June does need some encouragement, so I lift her up to you and pray that you will encourage her 
in the work. I also pray that you'll give her patience while she's waiting uh, for the possibility of the prisons to open up soon. Father, I pray for Aaron Halbert, who uh, serves you in Honduras in church planning efforts there. I, I pray for him, lift him up to you, encourage him in his work. And uh, Father, we look forward to seeing him soon uh, here uh, at Second Church. So I thank you for him and lift him up to you. And Father, is it, it already has been prayed for at Calvary Home, but I would also add... Um, um, uh, them to my prayer tonight that you encourage them in their work what a wonderful thing it is that uh, these children that have uh, faced very bad uh, situation and hardships in their lives uh, have a place to go and have a place to uh, hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ I also pray for the good news club I pray that uh, as they get organized and they start um, soon uh, having the Good News Club at Augusta Circle. I pray that for volunteers, and as was prayed for, I pray for the children also, that they uh, hear and understand the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, Father, I uh, lift these things up to you tonight, and uh, I thank you that you do hear our prayers. And these things I ask in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, we do thank you for these many issues that we have to ponder, to uh, pray for, as well as to assist uh, actively, passively, the many, many ways that we can be of assistance to these uh, issues that we've heard. I also would lift up those that we have not heard, Father, those that perhaps are not in writing, and yet uh, they are serious issues in the lives of many people that we know who are close to us and we lift those as well and now father as we open your word we do pray that you would uh, make us diligent to hear and ponder again the essence of what it is you have for us this night in the power of your holy spirit may your spirit speak powerfully into our hearts we pray these things in jesus name amen Let me get you to open, if you will, to Psalm 130. <clears throat> Psalm 130. We continue tonight with our study on the Psalms of Ascent. These are Psalms 120 through 134, and they're so named because the Holy Spirit has given us this nomenclature in his word and uh, Psalm 130 is uh, a psalm of eight verses very very unusual in this pattern of psalms of ascent in one way because Psalm 130 is one of the seven penitential psalms of the Psalter uh, the penitential psalms are basically what they would sound like there are psalms of penitence repentance psalms in which the psalmist is on his face before the lord in grief over his sinfulness and it's uh, therefore a psalm of, of repentance for sins as i mentioned there are seven throughout the psalter five of those seven interestingly written by our friend David, but this is not one of them. This psalm's author is not listed for us. But I want to give you a flavor of what you're going to see in Psalm 130 by reading the first two verses of these seven penitential psalms. Psalm number six begins this way. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. Psalm 38, O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath, for your arrows have sunk into me and your hand has come down on me. 
Psalm 51, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Psalm 102, hear my prayer, O Lord, let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me, answer me speedily in the day when I call. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. Psalm 143, hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me in your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. Now those, uh, it's, it's pretty obvious what's going on there, and uh, we see words like anguish, anguish over sin. We're going to make a case later for the fact that, unfortunately, we really don't understand sin as well as we should, and we don't feel that anguish as often as we should. But I wonder, when you hear that, we've been going through these Psalms of Ascent that perhaps we are led to think maybe this one breaks the pattern. Maybe it's just stuck in there somehow or other and does not follow the pattern that we have seen in these psalms. And I would uh, probably a few statements I would want to disagree with more heartily than that one. This is exactly in the pattern of these psalms of ascent. And I want to review those just a little bit to broaden your scope. We tend to look at the psalms of ascent, and we've said this over and over accurately that these appeared to be at, at the very least they were psalms or songs that were sung by the pilgrims of Israel as they journeyed up to Jerusalem to attend the feasts of their faith there's no problem with that but Psalms 120 through 134 the Psalms of Ascent these pilgrim songs are life journey songs so the notion of a pilgrimage is not something that you should think about as some sort of unique event in your life. This is your life as a Christian. You are on a journey. These psalms all fall into that category. This is walking with God is another way we have of saying it. A pilgrimage of the heart is another way of looking at these psalms. These are individualized devotional songs of pilgrims on that way. Now, whether their way is toward Jerusalem or in the 21st century, these psalms apply equally. This pilgrim idea is a deeply embedded notion, in other words, throughout Scripture. If you think of Abram, way back in the book of Genesis, what is it God tells him to do when he calls him out of Ur of the Chaldees? He said, Abram, come before me and walk. He doesn't even tell him where he's going. He just said, walk. You're on a journey, Abram. By Genesis 17, 1, he says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I want you to sense this notion of a walking pilgrimage through life. That is what the Psalms of Ascent speak to. Sometimes we call it the way. The notion of Christianity is a way. It's a journey. It's a pilgrimage. It's, it's moving through life. Now, again, I want to point out the fact that uh, these 15 psalms are divided into five triads, five groups of three, beginning with 120. And these three psalms are grouped each, in each instance, they are following a pattern. The opening psalm of a triad, for instance, Psalm 120, is a psalm of some kind of distress. So the psalmist is in a, a point in his life that is unusually distressing. In the middle psalm of the triad, which would be Psalm 121, the Lord's power to save the psalmist from this distress is what is emphasized. And finally, in the third psalm of the triad, in the first case, it would be Psalm 122, the psalmist arrives at some sort of resolution in this distress that he is in, and this follows throughout the 15 psalms. The final triad of this, these Psalms of Ascent 
that would be Psalms 132, 33, and 34, the journey toward Jerusalem is complete. And what you will see in Psalms 132, 3, and 4 is an emphasis on Zion, an emphasis on the fact that they have arrived. Uh, they are in Jerusalem, and their, their faces and words emphasize this fact of Zion. Now, Alec Motyer, who is uh, one of my favorite Old Testament um, scholars, has a fascinating appraisal of the Psalms of Ascent. He sees a shift in them. By the time you get to Psalm 126, what Motyer sees is a shift from external distress to internal distress. The distress is just as real, perhaps even more so, but the focal point of the psalm moves away from something that, that could be external to the psalmist to an issue that he is having internally. And now you see why Psalm 130 is what, such a magisterial component of the Psalms of Ascent, because Psalm 130 is the middle psalm of its triad. So what kind of distress is going to be met here? Well, I think you could get a, a hint of it from the other penitential psalms. This is a person who is aware of the fact that while he is on this journey, and yes, there are external enemies, one of his greatest enemies indeed, if not his greatest enemy, is within his own heart. So Psalm 130 is going to be a psalm of repentance. It's going to be the Lord's saving internally, arguably one of the greatest, if not the best and greatest example of this kind of, of work of the Lord uh, that can be known by the Christian. The way of forgiveness of sin, that is what we deal with in Psalm 130. Not surprisingly, the penitential Psalms, and certainly Psalm 130 in particular, have been enormously impactful on people over the years, on Christians over the years. Martin Luther called this one of the Pauline Psalms. He called it that because it offers forgiveness without works, something that Luther came to hold very dear. John Wesley, you're probably familiar with the famous story of Wesley's conversion, the Aldersgate Chapel and this uh, sort of thing. May 24, 1738. But what you don't perhaps know about is that same day, Wesley attended a chapel vesper service in St. Paul's Cathedral, which focused on Psalm 130. And what he said was, this psalm was moving to me. This psalm was working in me as I went to that experience, which he calls one in which he strangely warmed. And the rest, of course, is history with that particular man. Another person that was deeply touched by Psalm 130, arguably touched more than the vast majority, maybe even the most uh, of any person in Christian history, and certainly has touched more people through this experience, is a man named John Owen. John Owen is, uh, goodness, I'm not even... I, I don't have the time to go into well, what I want to tell you about John Owen, but to encourage you, this, uh, this man, is, his books, they're not read by the faint of heart, so be, be uh, aware of that, but uh, you can buy his collected works, all 16 volumes of them. But I want to read to you what he says happened to him in the year 1668. John Owen, famous British theologian, pastor, he says, I myself preached Christ some years when I had but very little, if any, experimental acquaintance with access to God through Christ, until the Lord was pleased to visit me with sore affliction, whereby I was brought to the mouth of the grave and under which my soul was oppressed with horror and darkness. But God graciously relieved by my spirit by a powerful application of Psalm 130, verse 4. That's a quote from John Owen. He would go on to write a commentary on Psalm 130, these eight verses, a 320-page commentary on eight verses. 
220 of those 300 plus pages are on verse 4 of Psalm 130. Now, we are not going to go into it in quite that depth. But my point is this psalm is powerful to any Christian who understands that he or she is on a journey, and this journey sometimes is most hindered by the sin that is in my own heart. This psalm will speak to that. Derek Kidner, another of my favorites, uh, says, At the end there is encouragement for the many from the experience of the one. Get into that a little bit later. Derek Thomas says it this way. It's about a man who is convicted of his sin before the righteousness of God and discovers that there is forgiveness. That's the greatest discovery of all, says Thomas. Let's get to this psalm. First two verses. Psalm 130 says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. Because of that beginning, this psalm is, is often uh, known in other circles as de profundis. That's a Latin expression which simply means out of the depths. In other words, a person who is foundering a person who perhaps would be mirrored by the 69th Psalm, the opening of Psalm 69, first two verses says this, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I've come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. Have you ever felt that way because of your sin? That's what the author of Psalm 130 is talking about, his sin. That is what troubles this man, this writer of Psalm 130. The issue is sin, and we, again, in the 21st century, we have largely lost this appreciation for our own depravity. We've lost that sense of our guilt and sin because we've lost God. I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about the church of Christ in the 21st century. Certainly not across the board, but largely we have lost this magisterial God that we are claimed by. And if you lose God, you will then lose a sense of your own sinfulness before such a God. If you lose the holiness of God, you will not be so accustomed to looking at your own lack of holiness. James Montgomery Boyce says this, we need to recover a sense of sin. We need to know that God's wrath is not an outmoded theological construct, but a terrible and impending reality. I've got to read that sentence again. We need to know that God's wrath is not an outmoded theological construct, but a terrible and impending reality. J.C. Ryle, we've studied here in this church. We've studied his wonderful book, Holiness. The beginning chapter is on sin. Here's the opening words of the beginning of that book. He that wishes to attain right views about Christian holiness must begin by examining the vast and solemn subject of sin. Ralph Venning, Puritan author of note, once wrote a book, a very famous book, called The Plague of Plagues, which has been renamed The Sinfulness of Sin. That explains the opening two verses of, of this 130th Psalm. The psalmist does the only thing that anyone can do in verse 2 regarding his or her awareness of the presence of this sin. He turns to God for mercy the mercy of forgiveness. End of verse 2 again. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. Now, verses 3 and 4. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. That last one 
walk with you. There is forgiveness that you may be feared. That's verse 4. That's what John Owen wrote more than 200 words or pages of commentary on what it meant to him and his life. In verse 3, of course, he acknowledges these sins, calls them iniquities here. So many of them, in fact, that he says they're too numerous to count, too overwhelming to allow me to stand in front of a holy God, he says. That resonates with the third chapter of Romans. If you're familiar, as I know you must be, uh, with the third chapter of Romans, you, you begin in that wonderful book, and it goes down and down. Oh, after about the 18th verse of chapter 1, I... Uh, by the time you get to the third chapter, you don't get much relief until you get to about uh, verse 21 or so. But if you look at verses 10, 11, and 12 of Romans 3, you'll see what the psalmist is talking about. However, just as in Romans chapter 3, there is a but here. Begins verse 4. But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. With God there is forgiveness. Going back to Jim Boyce again, he sees four truths about forgiveness that he wants us to understand. Number one, God's forgiveness is inclusive. And by that he means it has no limits. God doesn't say, I'll forgive you of these minor things over here, but oh my goodness, look what you've done. That's it. Mm. There is no limit to God's forgiveness. There is one unforgivable sin, but that's not what this psalmist is talking about here. God's forgiveness is inclusive. Number two, according to Boyce, it's for right now. He gets that from this, the tense and the tenor of verse four. With you, there is forgiveness. The psalmist is saying, I'm coming to you now, Lord, with a heart that is torn shamed, guilt-ridden by my sin, but with you there is forgiveness. With you there is forgiveness now for people exactly like me, the psalmist says. Third point about forgiveness, it leads to a heightened reverence for God and godly living. And finally, the fourth characteristic of forgiveness that Jim Boyce comes to us uh, from in this 130. 30th Psalm is for those who want it is this forgiveness, but you must ask God for it and trust him to give it to you. Forgiveness doesn't just happen. We can't just ignore our sinfulness. This is, again, one of the issues of today's Christian on the journey of faith. If we don't believe in a, in a high and lifted up God, the God of Scripture, this magisterial God, then my sin won't mean anything with me, and I'll simply ignore it. I'll simply talk to myself, perhaps, and say, well, I'll do better next time. Or maybe next time I'll try not to do quite that much of it. I'll just do this much of it, or any number of ways and means in which we will try to deflect this. But what, in fact, is needed is just what the psalmist does, gets on his face before God and pleads for forgiveness, which is ready. Now, notice the word feared in verse 4. Alec Motyer again, he says, This is not fear in any servile sense. I'm not coming before God because I fear what he's going to do to me. According to Motyer, it's a fear of offending one so loving and caring. Now think as a New Testament believer that, that has a Savior who has gone to a cross. I remember reading recently, I don't remember who was saying this, but, but the, the issue of Jesus going to that cross when his disciples, who had been with him for three years, he'd been teaching them, they had seen everything they needed to see and they were nowhere to be found. They were deserting him. They were falling asleep. Even on the eve of his crucifixion, they're, they're squabbling over which one is going to get the most credit for being with him. It would be very, very simple if you were in the shoes of Jesus, knowing to the degree he knew what was about to happen, to just say, these people aren't worth it. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I know there have been many times, frankly, you can just put this uh, over my head, I'm not worth it either. But Jesus loves totally his people. And none of that took him away from the cross. So this is no fear of offending one so forgiveness and in which his word is obeyed by forgiven sinners nowhere is the full awesome reality of the divine nature more present than in the bestowal of forgiveness it's an incredible thing when you stop and think about forgiveness and this is what bowled over john owen to the point where he hardly stopped writing this notion, you remember what uh, we read earlier where Owen is describing this point in his life where he has some kind of physical suffering, but that leads into something much more terrifying to him, and that's the suffering of his own heart and his own sinfulness. But this divine nature shows itself with the Savior going to a cross to redeem a people such as that, such as us. Charles Spurgeon translates verse 4 this way, There is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be loved and worshipped and served. Jim Boyce takes that writing from Spurgeon and said, that's a good way to test whether you are really seeking proper forgiveness. Because if you are, you understand that this God is not someone you sneak up on. It's not someone you have to cower in front of. It's not somebody that you have to fear is going to do something because of who you are and what you've done. Rather, it's going to lead to a confidence that this great God promises forgiveness and he will not fail to do so. And therefore, my response is love and worship and service. Go to verses 5 and 6. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning. More than watchman for the morning. You see the tenor of this psalm begin to, to turn. You see this, this man begin to be lifted up. He's waiting on God. What's he waiting for in verses 5 and 6? Well, he's not waiting for forgiveness. He's got that. He knows that. He's not waiting for deliverance from his troubles because he already has that too. He knows who he serves. He's waiting for God himself. The restoration of that fellowship that has been damaged due to sinfulness He's waiting for this renewal of this intimacy of a close walk in this journey to Jerusalem or to wherever. This renewal of fellowship that always follows repentance and forgiveness. Jim Boyce again has a fascinating statement from that concept. He says, take note of the fact that forgiveness does not depend on the psalmist feeling forgiven. Let me repeat that. Your forgiveness, my forgiveness of sinfulness does not depend on you and me feeling that we've been forgiven. We are forgiven when we seek with earnest hearts. Voice goes on to say he is forgiven whether he feels it or not because he's asked God for it and God has promised to forgive. That leads us into verses 7 and 8, the completion of this 130th Psalm. Verse 7 says, O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Now you're up on a mountaintop in just eight verses. It's stunning. One of the aspects of Scripture that never ceases to amaze me is the brief amount of writing that can take a believer from the bottom of the valley to the top of the mountain. In eight verses here, we've gone from this man who's feeling, uh, as Psalm 69 says, like he's drowning. He's, he's in water. And it's getting higher and higher. It's up to his neck. 
and he sees no hope, but he comes to the Lord for his hope, and he winds up on top of, of this mountain. So verses 7 and 8, trusting in God, trusting in redemption. The psalmist is turning from himself, and he encourages others to do so as well. Even Israel will be saved, he says. Redemption found only in God, a confidence that God will indeed redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Now, I want you to see a couple of phrases in these final two verses. I love them. There are, the first one, the steadfast love, hesed. This is a very, very special word that is scattered throughout the Old Testament, but preeminently in the Psalter. Over and over and over again, more than 125 times in the book of Psalms, has said this never-changing covenantal faithfulness and love of God toward his children. That's why the psalmist is not being presumptuous. He's not just wishing, boy, I hope, uh, I hope he heard my prayer of, of penitence. I hope he heard my repentant heart. I hope he knows what I'm really thinking. He knows that God is faithful. He knows that God hears. He knows that God will respond. Alec Montier, again, he loves to illustrate this word hesed. He does it many times with the illustration of marriage. And he said that when couples, human couples, fall in love, they share a heartfelt emotion that may lead them to marry. At their wedding, however, they pledge a love for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Both publicly affirm this sort of love before witnesses and before God by each saying, I will. In other words, the marriage vows are part of the will, not the feelings, the will. I purposely will to do these things, a settled commitment. It's not fluctuating on anything that might happen to either one of us. That's the human marriage ceremony. Now, the problem is, in every human marriage, both partners are sinners. And as we know, sometimes those wills change. But this is hesed we're talking about here. The psalmist comes before the Lord who has made the covenant, that covenant of grace, that beautiful umbrella that has all of those administrative components to it, to Adam and Eve, to, to Noah, to Abram, to it goes on to, to Moses, to David, and finally the new covenant of Jesus Christ. That has it won't fail. That is a will. That is the will of God himself who will not waver. So when I come to this God guilty of sin and confess my sin and repent of my sin and seek to change my behavior because of my feeling and my awareness of the fact that I have affronted him he will forgive you can take that one and count on it in other words i don't um i don't ever read this passage out of hosea without once you're a parent i i, I shouldn't even use that analogy it's so much greater than that this is from the 11th chapter of hosea God says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols, yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who cases the yoke on their jaws, and I bent down to them and fed them. They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword shall rage against their cities, consume the bars of their gates, and devour them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on turning away from me, and though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. <laughs> Talk about a transition with no words. Here is the next verse. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Admah? How can I treat you 
like Zeboam. My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children shall come trembling from the west. That's Hesed. That's guaranteed love and forgiveness that comes from it because it comes from God. Now I want you to notice another thing in these last two verses. In the ESV is called plentiful, right, plentiful redemption. King James Version and some others use plenteous redemption. What they're doing there, they're, they're, these people from especially the King James era have, have really taken note of a certain Bible translation in English by Miles Cloverdale. It was the first complete Bible published in the English language, complete meaning Old Testament and New Testament. Even while William Tyndall is being tortured for trying to do the same thing, in 1535, Cloverdale gets his out and understand what that means. In England, we're not talking about some uh, some place antithetical to Christianity. In England, at that time, possessing a Bible in the English language was a death sentence. Again, you and I take for granted what we carry around in so many different iterations with us. But verse 8 completes this transformation and ascent. God will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Sounds like Paul, Romans 5, verse 20, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That's this psalm of ascent. Psalm 130, again, in the middle of the triad, internalized this time, according to Motyer's perspective. This is a person who's still on the journey, but the journey is not so much as difficult from what is without this man, but from what is within in his own heart, his own sinful heart. But he comes, and by the end of just eight verses, he's back on top of the mountain. And you and I have that same glory. Now, I can't ignore a guy that writes 320 pages on uh, eight verses, so I've got to just tell you a little bit about John Owen. Here's what he says he is going to do in Psalm 130. He said, it's my desire to cover the following, how men contract the guilt of sin, what sense they have and ought to have of that guilt, what danger they're liable unto for it, what stresses and perplexities they have from it, what courses they choose for their relief of it. Then he says, next I'm going to go with what is that grace of God that alone will save them? What does it consist of? How was it prepared? How is it purchased? How is it proposed? How is it attained? Then he says, thirdly, I'm going to tell you what effects and consequences that this grace produces in the heart of any Christian. And finally, he says, how in these things faith and obedience unto God are exercised, how dependence upon God is exercised, how submission to God is exercised, and how waiting on God is exercised. incredible he, he paraphrased at, at the end of these 320 plus pages he paraphrases Psalm 130 this way he says it's as if he had said to them you are now in affliction and under troubles on account of your sins and provocations a condition that's sad and deplorable but yet there is hope in Israel concerning these things for consider how it has been with me and how the Lord has dealt with me. I was in depths inexpressible and saw for a while no way or means of delivery. But God has been pleased graciously to reveal himself to me as a God who pardons iniquity, transgression, and sin. And in the consolation and support which I have thus received, I am waiting for a full participation in the fruits of his love. Let me therefore prevail with you who are in the same condition to steer the same course with me. Only let your expectations be fixed on mercy and sovereign grace without any regard unto any privilege or worth in yourselves. Rest 
in the plenteous redemption, those stores of grace which are with Jehovah. And according to his faithfulness and his promises, he will deliver you out of all your perplexing troubles. This psalm is about repentance. I've uh, put a little one-page handout for anyone who wishes to have it. All it com is composed of are four definitions of repentance with a couple of books that I would recommend because this is an important part of your life as a Christian. Indeed, it is a mandatory part of your life. John Calvin, in book three, chapter three, equates repentance with regeneration. In other words, if you think your heart has been changed from stone to flesh, then look for repentance. If you're not repenting of your sin, then I question whether you think you're a Christian. John Owen, of course, is on there. This, uh, this is his book, by the way. This is volume six of his 16 volumes. And this is what has the 300 pages, but it's got more than that. He begins with the mortification of sin. How is it if I want to be a serious Christian, I want to put to death the sin that is in me? Secondly, how do I deal with temptation? Thirdly, how do I deal with the indwelling sin that is present in every believer? And then fourthly, therefore, an exposition of Psalm 130. Again, not for the faint of heart. I hope somebody will take up the challenge. I've got another book there from Jack Miller, C. John Miller on repentance. Wonderful, wonderful uh, ministerial, pastorally oriented book on repentance. I've got a little bitty short one in there from Sinclair Ferguson on the grace of repentance. So if you want one of those, uh, just feel free to take one. I've, I've uh, made some there for you. But uh, preeminently what I want you to see is when you're on this journey of life, you're just like this pilgrim. You and I both have issues that come from without, and the bigger issues perhaps come from within. We can all, we've heard all night, and we deal uh, often with the issues that come from without, issues of health, issues of, of uh, people doing bad things to good people, all of that kind of thing. But your sin is a larger hurdle, and Psalm 130 and these pilgrim songs will teach you how to make the same journey Abram made. You're not going to make it perfectly. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. You're going to sin. But you have a God whose hesed, whose complete covenantal faithfulness and love will cover you. Go to him in forgiveness, in repentance. Pour your heart out before him. Seek to be different in the way you live your life. And know that you are blessed until you see him face to face. Let's pray. Father, we do, uh, we do marvel again at how eight little verses of a psalm, a poem, a song can, can tap into such depth. Uh, Father, do forgive us of our sinfulness. Help us to become aware of our sinfulness. Help us to be those who know what it means to repent. It's a lifelong effort. It is not something that happens when we sign our name on a card, come forward to an altar, uh, say special words, have an event happen in our lives. This is something that happens every single day in the life of the Christian, a self-examination that leads to an effort through the power of your Holy Spirit to change and live lives that are more honorable and in keeping with your holy word. We do pray that you would make us those people, Father, and help us above all to know, not to fear, not to doubt, but to know that your love, your hesed faithfulness covers us every moment of every day until we see you face to face. We thank you for that grace and that mercy all through your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Uh, Chuck, let's sing the doxology. Please stand.